Good afternoon, everybody. It's really nice to see so many people here, and can I welcome uh, many of our guests, many people from Deakin University. Uh, it's great to see you here, and I, we need to do more of these seminars. That's quite clear with the, the audience we've got today. Um, it's with enormous pleasure today that I, I, I've got the job of introducing you to Professor Peter Doherty, who will be giving the talk today on immunity to influenza. Many of you will, will, will be aware of Peter, but I'll go briefly through his bio to, to cover off. And Peter graduated from the University of Queensland in veterinary science and became a veterinary officer before moving to Scotland, to re where he received his PhD from the University of Edinburgh. Peter shared the Nobel Prize in Physiology in 1996 with Swiss colleague Ralph Zingernagel for their discovery of how the immune system recognises virus-infected cells. He was, in fact, the first veterinarian to win a Nobel Prize. He was Australian of the Year in 1997 and since basically been commuting between St Jude's Research Hospital in Memphis and the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Melbourne. And his research interest is mainly in the field of defence against viruses. He's written a number of books, uh, and there's two of them up there. The one might fascinate you is The Beginner's Guide to Winning the Nobel Prize. <laughs> I've just started reading it and I haven't got there yet. So, Peter, it's with much pleasure that I invite you to give a presentation to the Deacon and our staff on immunity to influenza. Thanks very much, Martin. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I don't think I, I think it's more than 20 years since I've been at Arl. I was um, I was the chair of the first scientific advisory committee for um, Bill Snowden when we were still fighting with a lot of people who didn't want Arl to happen. Uh, unfortunately, it did happen, and I think it's been a great success. And, uh, and now we have Deakin University in town as well, and uh, I think uh, things are looking pretty good in Geelong. So, great. Um, influenza. Well, mostly I've worked on a lot of viruses over the years, but uh, now we're focused uh, pretty much totally on influenza. But I'm not going to talk just about our work. I'm going to try and give you a bit of a feeling for what's happening with respect to immunity to influenza. Um, in, in different, uh, different labs and so forth. But my own situation is uh, I'm mainly at the University of Melbourne, which, as you, many of you will know, this building, the old microbiology department, the portal loose outside. We do have internal plumbing, actually. But <laughs> that was for the new uh, building that went up next door. And uh, it's actually a wonderful building, the new neuroscience building. Um, this is the group at Melbourne, and my function now, I've just turned 70, so I'm on the way out. I've written my last grant, and so what I do is, uh, is I talk about experiments, I shred people's papers, and uh, <laughs> try to make them feel a bit uncomfortable at times, and, uh, and generally, uh, um, and, and I've been writing books too. I've written a couple of books, and I've just finished, or I've just given a third one to the publishers called Sentinel Chickens. Now, to any other audience, I would probably have to explain what sentinel chickens are, but I shouldn't have to explain it to you guys. Uh, the other program at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, um, I've been mostly in Melbourne over the last 10 years, but uh, eight years, but um, still go backwards and forwards to St. Jude. And we have a very big systems biology grant at St. Jude with the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle and people in the University of California, San Diego and Vanderbilt where we're looking at the proteomics, genomics, and lipidomics of early influenza infection. And though that's way beyond me in the terms of the detail and the mathematics and statistics and so forth that are required to do these types of analysis, it's actually extremely interesting because we're throwing up all sorts of new targets, uh, new sorts of molecular interactions and pathways that we wouldn't have thought of looking at in something like influenza. For instance, the wound healing genes are really quite important. And, and we've also turned up some stuff about the new uh, swine flu, uh, H1N1 swine flu, that I think is going to be very interesting. And it's currently being um, got ready for publication. Um, the group at St. Jude is headed, headed by this, uh, this guy. He looks like a teenager, Paul Thomas, but he's a really bright guy and is, uh, is doing great stuff um, now. Okay, flu virus, um, it's probably familiar to many of you, a negative sense of RNA virus, doesn't have any proofreading during replication. Like HIV, it's throwing off mutants all the time and you've got tremendous variability. Um, and uh, 
Mostly, of course, it's a disease that's in birds. Uh, it's been very well studied, but there's still a great deal we need to learn about influenza, and with the new reverse genetics technologies and so forth, we've been getting ahead with that fairly quickly. So as an immunologist, uh, my, um, my strategy really has been to work in places where there's terrific virology. And it's great to see that at Arvel now, uh, we're just now starting to get some, some good immunology uh, or an expansion of the immunology that's been going on. And, uh, and, and I think, of course, you've got the, the virologists. I, I look forward. This is going to be the world centre for bat immunology, uh, which is really something, I think, uh, to have the leading bat immunologist not far away. Uh, Flu viruses maintained in water birds in nature. There's something like 16 hemagglutinin and nine neuraminidase types. Those, of course, are the two surface glycoproteins on flu that are accessible to antibody, and those are just major targets in immunity. Um, only three of those have ever really become established in humans. Uh, the H1N1, going back to 1918 and, and before that, and of course now with the swine flu virus that's uh, uh, really gone around the world very, very quickly and it's incredibly infectious. Uh, the H2N2, which came along in 1957 uh, and then disappeared after the H3N2 came along in 1968. Uh, the H2N2, when it did emerge, we think that the H1N1, the 1918-19, killed at least 40 million people. The H2N2 sort of comes second in that stakes. It killed about a million. And then H3N2, which was a reassortment, uh, you know, it's, it's the eight different bits of the influenza genome. They repackage if you get the same cell infected with two different viruses. The uh, H3N2 is a reassortment between the H2N2 that was circulating in humans and an H3N8, which was a duck virus. Um, and then there's these whole other range. Sometimes they jump into humans. H5N1, of course, has caused us a lot of angst over the last few years. Uh, rarely infects humans. You have to get a very big dose, it seems, that goes right down into the lung where you have the right receptors. But if you do get infected with it, it's a 60% mortality rate. So far, it hasn't spread between humans. H7, N7, uh, gone across into horses. Uh, H9 occasionally infects humans. H7, N7 occasionally affects humans and so forth. And, uh, and of course now there are flu viruses that have gone from horses into dogs. Uh, for the first time we now start seeing uh, flu established in dogs in the United States, starting with greyhounds and then in the general dog population. Um, this whole bird story is really quite recent. And there's a little rhyme that went around at the time of the 1918 influenza outbreak, which went, I had a little bird and its name was Enza. I opened the window and influenza. Now, that was a kid's rhyme, uh, but it, it was kind of prophetic because influenza is basically a disease of birds. But we didn't really start to understand that until the 1960s, uh, when firstly, uh, Helio Pereira in uh, Mill Hill, the great virologist uh, from South America originally, um, started to take an interest in the fact that flu viruses were being isolated from birds by people like Rudy Rott in Giesen and also down in South, South Africa there were some isolates from wild birds. And he and a lady called Bela Tumova got together and started to work on this. Rob Webster, who was uh, at St Jude and also still working at ANU with Graham Laver, uh, also worked with them for a bit. And then it was really Webster and Laver who took on the whole um, uh, story of the avian influenza viruses and kind of with their various students and so forth worked it out and of course also Labor's uh, work with Coleman on the neuraminidase led to Relenza, the uh, 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 antiviral. Um, they transmit in birds. The H5N1 uh, started to go, it was start of 1997, 1995, I think 1995, 1997 in Hong Kong, went south in bird populations, um, killed a lot of birds. A lot of the spread is thought to have been by illegal movement of birds, in fact. Uh, and then uh, it didn't sort of go, go west until I think it was 2002. There was an event that occurred in Qinghai Lake in western China. Uh, the virus mutated. It may have mutated in large chicken production facilities not far from Qinghai Lake. And the Chinese had started to breed 
bar-headed geese very close by because they wanted to vary the diet of the railroad workers in that area. And it's thought that what happened was that the virus got from the chicken houses into the bar-headed geese. The bar-headed geese, which were highly susceptible, <coughs> then carried it back to Queen High Lake, which was very close by, and then it became established in the plethora of waterfowl of various species on Queen High Lake. And so here you've got a virus in bar-headed geese that kills very quickly, also kills swans very quickly, various other birds very quickly, but it doesn't kill ducks, even though it's infecting ducks and transmitted by ducks. So there you have an ideal epidemiological or epizootological, if you want to be more precise, situation for maintaining a virus in nature. Flu viruses particularly infect water birds because they survive very well in water. And here you have species with different susceptibilities, some of which die, but then some of which will carry the virus, and they carried it right across to Europe. And we all know what happened there when it got right up into Scandinavia, down into Egypt, North Africa, and all the rest of it. Some deaths in humans. It's been incredibly difficult to get the H5N1 eradicated from chicken flocks in Asia. They think they've controlled it, and then the new season starts and it comes back again. And so it's a continuing grumbling problem. We still have occasional deaths, and it's still out there, though uh, so far it hasn't started to transmit to humans. Of course, we're kind of protected down in Australia from a lot of these bird viruses by, by Wallace, what we, we attributed to Wallace's line, the, the, um, the, which uh, Alfred Russell Wallace worked out in the 19th century, and really follows the line of the tectonic plate, in fact, that, uh, that goes up to the Philippines. Now, flu itself is an incredibly infectious virus in humans. Uh, the, real, the, the reason that influenza is so dangerous is that we get very high titers of virus in the upper respiratory tract and then, then down into the lung very, very quickly. We get infected, we're coughing and spluttering the viruses, we still feel reasonably okay. We go to school, we go to work, we get on a plane, we fly, and then you know, we start to feel sick a bit later. Uh, quite unlike, say, the SARS virus, which uh, we didn't understand at the outset. We had to actually isolate the virus before we understood that, but not we. I'm not talking about me personally. But uh, um, what was found, of course, is that SARS is a very high teeter when that coronavirus is a very high teeter when people are sick. Flu is a very high teeter early on when people feel normal. And that's why with flu, the family usually gets it, everyone around gets it, and it spreads very fast. Uh, the, the swine flu, first the H1N1, the swine flu in the, the, 19th, uh, the 2009, I think it was first, someone may correct me, but I think it was first isolated in California, Mexico in about the March or April, <laughs> and it was in Australia by May, and uh, in Melbourne. And then it went right around Australia, and it went right around the world very, very fast. And so very, very rapidly spreading virus. In fact, um, um, you know, it, it's one of the most infectious of the flu viruses, I think. Though people think that there are, I was talking to Ann Kelso about it yesterday, who runs the WHO Flu Centre. They still think there's a lot of people out there who haven't been infected, and also they haven't been vaccinated. And there's a perception around, of course, that this virus is not that bad. The reason that people think that is because people over, the people who usually die from influenza are people like me, uh, the geriatrics. I mean, if you're over, if you're over 65 or 70, uh, as we get older, everything declines, including our immune system. Intellectually, we go bananas. And uh, <laughs> most of it, half of us are demented by the time we're 85. I'm not there yet. But, um, but it's the older people who die from influenza. It used to be called the old man's friend. You know, the, the, you get the influenza outbreak, so you wheel everyone out on the veranda in the nursing home and free up a few beds. But, um, <laughs> but with this virus, people who were born before, uh, born before 1950 are actually protected, relatively protected, because we've got cross-reactive antibody from something else that was circulating earlier. And some of the genes in the 1919 flu virus, not the hemagglutinin and the main protective one, but some of those genes are actually genes that have come down from the 1918 virus in the, uh, in the pigs. And, uh, and so, People say this is not a bad virus, but it's been killing healthy young adults. It's been putting six times as many uh, pregnant women in intensive care beds. Uh, and the intensivists have been horrified by it. Uh, they've been using heart-lung machines to pull people through. And you know, you don't have that many heart-lung machines around, uh, even in Geelong. So uh, it, uh, it, it's, it's not a good virus, and everyone actually should be vaccinated against it. But people have been rather reluctant to get vaccinated. 
Here's flu going across the United States. This is just a uh, seasonal flu. The red is influenza, not republicanism. <laughs> and, uh, and you can see that like a lot of really bad stuff in the States, it starts in Texas. But, uh, there you are, right across the States in six weeks. Uh, now, the defense we've got against infection, of course, the defense is the immune.